Hello, my name is Leighton Flowers. I am the director of apologetics for Texas Baptist. I have uh, started a podcast um, called Sociology 101. Also, I have a blog where I wrote an article and I've now actually published a book um, through Trinity Seminary, where I'm also serving as an adjunct professor that chronicles my journey out of Calvinism. And I wanted to record that for those who would rather watch it than just read it. Uh, it goes like this. Many have asked what specific points led me away from Calvinism, being a professor of theology and one who once affirmed the tulip systematic, that does give me somewhat of a unique perspective on the subject. However, I, I, do don't, I don't really claim to be a, an expert necessarily in the field, nor do I begrudge those who disagree with my perspective. I'm, I'm simply desiring to interpret rightly the Word of God, as I assume all of us are as Christians. Hopefully, the podcast that I've produced and the article that I've written, the book that I've written, um, they can help people at least understand, if nothing else, why I could not continue to support the Calvinistic interpretation of the text. I believe that there are many who are hoping to convince someone that they care about to leave behind Calvinistic beliefs. And I, I hate to tell them, but it's, it's doubtful that a blog or a post or a podcast will ever accomplish that huge feat. It is very difficult to convince yourself to leave a long-held theological perspective behind, and it's next to impossible to convince someone else. For me, it was a painstaking three-year journey after I engaged in an in-depth study of the subject. I had really no desire to leave Calvinism, and I fought tooth and nail to defend my beloved, quote-unquote, doctrines of grace against the truths that my studies led me to see. There was no single book, there was no single article or a discussion that led me to recant my adherence to Calvinism. In fact, I'm quite certain I could have never been debated out of Calvinism. I was much too competitive to objectively evaluate my systematic in the heat of a contentious type of discussion. And even if I were to come against an argument I could not answer, I, I, I would have never admitted that to my, to my opponent. Few individuals would be able to get around the intense emotion and pride-inducing adrenaline brought on by debating theology. Our innate desire to be esteemed by others and seen as smarter than we really are often overwhelms any potential for learning and profitable dialogue, which is unfortunate. If someone disagreed with me, my presumption was they must not really understand my perspective. So instead of attempting to listen and objective, objectively evaluate their arguments, I typically focused on restating my case more clearly, confidently, and dogmatically. If I did not fully understand what they were saying, I would often label them and dismiss them instead of taking the time to fully evaluate their point of view. Now listen, I am not attempting to suggest that every Calvinist who remains a Calvinist is making the same errors that I made. I'm only reflecting on what I now view as my own mistakes and my own shortcomings. I competed on the state level in cross-examination debate in high school and later in college. Our debate coaches drilled into us the skill of taking on both the affirmative and negative side of every issue. And believe me, that is a learned or developed skill. It is very difficult to put down one view in the defense of another opposing view, especially if you are emotionally and intellectually attached to a given perspective. It is rare to find real objectivity in a discussion among theologically minded individuals over a doctrine that is as emotionally charged, as, as, as intimately personal as that of our salvation. This is especially true of those who have made a living and developed their identity around a particular set of beliefs. Imagine, for example, R.C. Sproul or um, someone like John MacArthur coming to believe they were mistaken on these particular points of doctrine. Think how much it would cost him and his reputation as a scholar to recant those views. It's never an easy or painless transition, no matter the level of notoriety one may be. I say all this to simply tell any Calvinistic readers who may have clicked on this link in order to refute my claims, I am not so naive as to think this article, my, my blog, my podcast, or any uh, video that I produce is going to convince you to leave Calvinism. That's, that's not really my goal. My goal, however, is that you simply understand 
the reasons I left Calvinism. That most likely cannot happen if you begin with an axe to grind or a point to defend or an argument to win. Can we put down the weapons and first seek to hear and fully understand each other before launching into a debate? If you finish this video and you listen to the podcast and you walk away still as Calvinistic as you are right now, but at least you understand why I felt I had to leave Calvinism, then I would consider this a great success. I adopted all five points of the Calvinistic tulip when I was a freshman in college after digesting books from John MacArthur, R.C. Sproul, uh, J.I. Packer, and later John Piper. Louis Giglio, in fact, the man who really brought John Piper into the mainstream through events like Passion, was one of my father's close friends. My father's um, ministry connections also gave me a lot of influence with other leading ministry uh, advocates, and, and some of them were very Calvinistic leaning, and I was able to rub shoulders with and to meet many of these individuals throughout my life. My first ministry position was uh, at, with a ministry called Grace at Hardin Simmons University, which is modeled really after Louis's ministry at, at Baylor uh, in, the, in the 80s. And here's where I worked alongside um, men like Matt Chandler, which many people are very aware of because of his great ministry here in the Dallas area. And uh, many of the people that I worked with at this time in college uh, also were a part of this grace ministry. And we were discipled, Matt and I were discipled by the same mentor there at Grace. And I, I grew very convinced in, in Calvinism over the next decade of life even helping to start a, Re a Reformed Baptist church that split off of my home church. And this is where my parents and all their friends attended, and I, I only see now how much this must have hurt them during that process. Later, I did serve on staff at this Reformed church, and uh, then I began working at the state convention not long thereafter. Um, while I was working at the convention, we had hired men like John Piper, and along with various other very notable Calvinistic communicators, uh, to speak at some of the events that I uh, coordinate as a, when I was a youth evangelism consultant for Texas Baptist and a lot of the events that we did. We would bring in a lot of uh, speakers, like I said, that were very Calvinistic leaning and um, great brothers, great communicators. And I very much loved being a part of this brotherhood of ministers who proudly affirmed the doctrines of Spurgeon and the forefathers of our Southern Baptist faith. And I was a card-carrying member, in a sense, of the founders of the SBC, and I would have never dreamed that one day I would be writing this article or producing this video. One morning I was reading a book by A.W. Tozer, a man I respected and I knew was respected from those in the Calvinistic community. After all, John Piper often quoted him and referenced his works, and uh, my reform circles often referred to uh, A.W. Tozer. And so Something he wrote that I was reading on one particular day just did not fit into my paradigm. And I remember thinking, isn't Tozer a Calvinist? I distinctly remember how I felt when I learned, after some research, that A.W. Tozer, in fact, was not a Calvinist. Nor was C.S. Lewis, another man I greatly uh, respected and influ that influenced me. Um, and I realized both of them did not affirm the TULIP system. Um, at that point, I, I remember thinking even back to my debate training and what it had taught me ab about objectively evaluating both sides of a particular issue. And this is really what started my journey. I figured to myself, A.W. Tozer, C.S. Lewis, both smart guys, and I just kind of assumed if you're smart, you had to be a Calvinist, and these guys weren't. And so I began to wonder, why not? And I began down a journey that eventually led me away from Calvinism. It was six months to a year into the sporadic you know, study of doctrines, and I, I wasn't the least bit convinced that Calvinism was wrong even after about six months to a year into the studies. Even after I was presented with a lot of very convincing arguments against my long-held beliefs, I had subconsciously, I think, felt I had too much to lose to leave Calvinism. My reputation, my friends, my ministry connections, they, it felt like they would all be gone somehow if I recanted my views on this. Um, I had converted way too many people. I'd hurt too many relationships and standing in defense of, of my views 
Um, my home church split over the subject. My parents went through a huge amount of, of uh, turmoil over me and my brother and our families leaving our home church after growing up there and, and starting a new church. It was just too much, too, emotion, too much emotion uh, attached to this to, to leave it. However, I think that the, the skill that I had developed, I guess, and had really learned as a, a debater helped me to recognize that I had a bias and that I had to proceed in my studies and kind of put my bias aside. And as I was trained, I, I kind of forced myself to drop those preconceived ideas, the lenses through which I was viewing the scriptures and my arguments, my biases, and anything that could hinder me from really understanding the other perspective. Even if I didn't want to necessarily accept it, I needed to really understand why men like A.W. Tozer, men like C.S. Lewis, did not accept the tulip systematic. In that process, there were five key truths that came to light, and probably not just five, but I would limit it to five uh, for this discussion that led me out of Calvinism. And this is just a short summary of those five points that led me to recant Calvinism. Point number one, I came to realize that the foresight faith view, which is really classical Wesleyan Arminianism, it was not the only scholarly alternative to the Calvinistic interpretation. You see, I'd so saturated myself with Calvinistic preachers and authors that the only thing I knew of the opposing views was what they told me. Thus, I had been led to believe that the only real alternative to Calvinism was this kind of strange concept of God looking through the quarters of time to elect those he foresees would choose him. Notable Calvinistic teachers seem to almost always paint all non-Calvinistic scholars as holding to this perspective. Once I realized that I had been kind of misled on this point, I was more open to consider other interpretations more objectively. I found a much more robust and theologically sound systematic in what is often called the corporate view of election, which so happened to be really the most predominant view among the biblical scholars of my own denomination, Southern Baptists. Much more could be said about this view that I will not take the liberty to expound upon in this article. However, I must warn readers that the all too common phrase, quote, nations are made up of individuals too, does not even begin to rebut the claims of this perspective. Individuals are just as much involved in the corporate perspective as are the Calvin, as are, the, are within the Calvinistic perspective, maybe even more so. Anyone who believes that the corporate view is easily dismissed with the simple one-liner has not yet to come, really understand uh, the view rightly. And, and in my experience, few Calvinists give this view the attention it deserves because it requires a shift in perspective that, if recognized, would really undermine their entire premise. The corporate view of election is sometimes referred to as traditionalism among Southern Baptists. It's kind of a traditional corporate view. Um, it even uh, incorporates some of what some refer to as the, the, the election to service view, because there's aspects of God electing individuals to service, but there's also a corporate aspect of being in Christ. And I, I'm just simply asking the question, do you understand the traditionalist perspective, the corporate view of election, the, the election to service view? Have you really studied it? Honestly, could, could you, if you were forced to right now, to be a debater and take the other side of the debate, could you defend the corporate view of election or traditionalism and do it well if you really had to, to save your life? If you could, could you do it? Could you explain it objectively to a classroom of students as a professor and, 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 a, and a traditionalist be in the room and say, yeah, that's exactly the way I would describe it. You did a really good job describing and defending what we believe. Are you willing to evaluate us? Are you willing to understand us well enough to be able to do that? That's all I'm asking. Aristotle has said, it is the mark of an educated mind to be able to entertain a thought without accepting it. I'm simply asking you, will you entertain it? Will you at least give us a fair hearing? Point number two, I came to understand the distinction between the doctrine of original sin, the concept of depravity, as you've heard it, and the Calvinistic concept of total inability. You see, Calvinists teach that the natural man is blind and deaf to the message of the gospel. But I learned that that's really a condition of one who's been hardened or calloused, or some even say 
judicially given over or judicially blinded in their sin. This is not a natural condition from birth, as many passages of Scripture indicate. Instead, God's gracious revelation and powerful gospel appeal is the means he has chosen to draw or enable whosoever hears it to come. Anyone who does hear it may respond to it, which is why they're held response able, able to respond, able to respond willingly or to trade it in for a lie. At the time while Christ was here on earth, the Israelites in John 6, for example, were being hardened. They were being blinded from hearing the truth. Only a select few Israelites, a remnant, were given by the Father to the Son in order for God's purpose and election of Israel to be fulfilled. That purpose was not referring to God's plan to individually and effectually save some Jews, but his plan was to bring the light or the revelation to the rest of the world by way of the Messiah and his message, so that all may believe, as John 17, 21b says. You see, the vine, the Jews are being cut off in Romans 11. It's not the vine of effectual salvation. Otherwise, how could individuals be cut off or grafted back into it? The, the vine, I believe, represents the church or even the light of revelation, the means through which one may be saved was first sent to the Jews, and then it was sent to the Gentiles, as Romans 1.16 says. The Gentiles are being granted repentance. They're being grafted into the vine so as to be enabled to repent. The Jews, if provoked to envy and leave their unbelief, may be grafted back into that same vine, as Romans 11.14 and verse 23 indicate. Now, here's the key point. God does use persuasive or determinative means, you might even say, to ensure that his sovereign purpose in electing Israel will come to pass. For example, he, he, he might set apart certain individual Israelites to carry the lineage of the Messiah. Certain individuals were obviously chosen to be the line through whom the Messiah would come. There's also the setting apart of certain individuals to carry his divinely inspired message. Certain prophets like Elijah, certain apostles like Paul, chosen from Israel to carry the message to the world. And sometimes he might even use convincing means, persuasive outward external means like big fish or blinding lights or showing his nail-scarred hands to Thomas, for example, in order to persuade, to ensure his messengers will be sent to go. He might even temporarily blind the rest of Israel in order to accomplish his redemption through even their rebellion. In other words, he can show mercy on Israel when it serves his purpose to show mercy on them, and he can harden Israelites in their already rebellious, callous condition if it serves his purpose to carry about his promise of redemption. However, there's no indication in Scripture that all those who do believe the appointed messenger's teachings were likewise set apart by such persuasive means especially inward effectual means. So, so in other words, just because God used persuasive means to make sure that Jonah would go to Nineveh doesn't prove that God uses some inward irresistible means to make certain Ninevites believe Jonah's message. In the same way, God's choice of Israel and men like Paul and his setting apart of men like Paul and Thomas and Peter and all these others doesn't prove that God effectually decides who's going to believe those messengers' teachings. It also doesn't ever say that the, those who don't believe the appointed messenger's teachings were, were hardened from the time they were born to the time they died. Just because God hardened Israel for a particular purpose at a particular time doesn't prove that all men are born in an already hardened, completely, uh, totally disabled condition where they're morally incapable of responding to the clear revelation of God. That would give them the very excuse that Paul took away in Romans 1.20. See, as a Calvinist, I did not understand that the historical context of the Scriptures, as it relates to the national election of Israel, followed by their judicial hardening, when, their, when the Scriptures spoke of Jesus hiding the truth in parables, or only revealing himself to a select few, or cutting off large numbers of people from seeing, hearing, and understanding the truth, I immediately presumed that those were passages supporting the two, the, the T, the total inability of my tulip. When in reality, they were supporting the doctrine of Israel's judicial hardening. I like what uh, Dr. James Leo Garrett of Southwestern Baptist Theological Seminary said in his um, two-part uh, work on theology, systematic theology. He said this, 
Quote from Augustine of Hippo to the 20th century, Western Christianity has tended to interpret the doctrine of election from the perspective of and with regard to individual human beings. During those same centuries, the doctrine has been far less emphasized and seldom ever controversial in Eastern Orthodoxy. Is it possible that Augustine and later Calvin, with the help of many others, contributed to a hyper-individualization of this doctrine that was hardly warranted by Romans 9-11, through 11, Ephesians 1, and 1 Peter 2? Is it not true that the major emphasis in both Testaments falls upon an elect people, Israel in the Old Testament, and the disciples, the church in the New Testament? Point number three. I realize that the decision to humble yourself and repent in faith is not notorious. Even repentant believers deserve eternal punishment. See, Calvinists are notorious for asking the unsuspecting believer, why did you believe in Christ and someone else did not? Are you smarter? Are you more praiseworthy in some way? I asked this question more times than I can remember as a young Calvinist trying to convince everyone to become a Calvinist. What I, and likely the target of my inquiry, did not understand is that the question itself is a fallacy known as begging the question, or more specifically, it's a complex question. You see, begging the question is a debate tactic where your opponent presumes true the very point up for debate. For instance, if the issue being disputed was whether or not you cheat on your taxes, and I began the discussion by asking you, have you stopped cheating on your taxes yet? I would be begging the question. Likewise, in the case of the Calvinist asking, why did you make this choice? He's presuming a deterministic response is necessary in this. He's beginning the discussion with a circular and often confounding game of question begging. The inquiry as to what determines the choice of a free will presumes something other than the free will function of the agent's will making the determination, thus denying the very mystery of what makes the free will free and not determined. Some people can't catch this. I didn't catch it for a long time until I was more trained in debate and the different tactics that could be used, like question begging. You see, the cause of a choice is the chooser. The cause of a determination is the determiner. It's not an undetermined determination or an unchosen choice, as some attempt to frame it. If someone had an issue with this explanation and simply just just apply this to the question of, okay, then why did God choose to create mankind? He obviously is all self-sustaining and self-sufficient, isn't he? He, he doesn't need you to exist. You, surely you don't believe that God needs you to exist, does he? Therefore, certainly no one would suggest that God was not free to refrain from creating humanity or creating you or saving you, was he? Okay, so he made a libertarianly free will. What determine God's choice to create if not the mysterious function of his own free, autonomous will? He could have refrained or not refrained from that given moral action. That's what libertarian freedom is. In short, whether one appeals to the mystery regarding the function of man's free will or the function of the divine will, we all eventually appeal to mystery. Why not appeal to mystery before drawing conclusions that could in any way impugn the holiness of God by suggesting that he had something to do with determining the, nat the natural desires of evil men and their choices? What must also be noted is that the decision to trust in Christ for our salvation is not a notorious work. Asking for forgiveness does not merit being forgiven. Think of it this way. Did the prodigal son earn or merit or in any way deserve the reception of his father on the basis that he humbly returned home? Of course not. He deserved to be punished, not rewarded. The acceptance of his father was a choice of the father alone, and it was all of grace. The father did not have to forgive or restore or throw a party for his son on the basis that he chose to come home. That was the father's doing. He completely, all by himself, made the choice as to what to do with that son on his return. You see, humiliation, brokenness, it's not considered better or praiseworthy, and it's certainly, it's not inherently valuable. The only thing that makes this quality, quote-unquote, desirable is that God has chosen to grace those who humble themselves, something he is in no way obligated to do. God gives grace to the humble, not because a humble response deserves salvation, but because he's gracious. Also, I think I should note here 
that in addition to the free choice of God to create or not create, we could also appeal to the free choice of Satan to rebel or the free choice of Adam and Eve to sin. How do we explain those free choices? Even leading Calvinists appeal to the mystery of the libertarian freedom of both Satan and Adam and Eve in the garden. And so there's no reason just to accept the mystery of the function of man's free will. Point number four. I accepted the fact that a gift doesn't have to be irresistibly applied in order for the giver to get full credit for giving it. According to Calvinism, God does not merely enable people to believe, as the scripture says, but he has to actually change their very nature so as to certainly make them believe. As a Calvinist, I remembered shaming other Christians for quote-unquote stealing God's glory by suggesting they played any role in the reconciliation process. Think about that. Reconciliation, the bringing together of two parties. Heaven forbid we actually think that both parties are involved in that. I insisted that, that the non-Calvinist would be boasting to believe that they chose to come to Christ unless they first admitted that God irresistibly changed their nature to make them want to come. I recall a, a wise elder from my home church challenging me on this point by asking the question, why do you believe God's choice of you for no apparent reason is less boastworthy than his choice of me for being a weak beggar? I honestly, I, I did not know what he meant at the time, but I do now. You see, at the time of that encounter, I had not reached the pigsty of my own life. I was young. I was arrogant. I had never really been broken by my sin and brought face to face with my depravity. I thought I understood forgiveness and grace, but truthfully, it was not until much later in life that I would be brought to the end of myself, so to speak. I used to think the, the idea that God chose to save me before I was born and done anything good or bad was humbling, but it was not near as humbling as a reality that God would choose to save me in the middle of my worst sin, my brokenness, my humiliation, and my shame. Like the prodigal who returned home from the pigsty of his life, broken and humiliated, seeking to beg for handouts, deserving nothing but punishment, receives instead the gracious love of a father. I too felt the choice of a father to forgive me right then and there in the middle of my filth. It was not some theological concept of God picking me for no apparent reason out of the mass of humanity at some distant, inexplicable time before time was. It was my Abba, my Dada, choosing to love me in the middle of my deepest sin and pride-crushing shame. No one, no Arminian, no Calvinist, or anyone in between, I mean no one, boasts about being forgiven like that. If they do, I doubt they've experienced the humility that God is asking us to come to him with. If they do, if they do boast in such humility, or they think others would boast in that kind of humility. I cannot imagine they've ever experienced it themselves. Jeremiah 9.24 says, But let him who boasts boast in this, that he understands and knows me, that I am the Lord who practices steadfast love, justice, and righteousness in the earth. For in these things I delight, declares the Lord. C.S. Lewis wrote, A man can no more diminish God's glory by refusing to worship him then a lunatic can put out the sun by scribbling the word darkness on the walls of his cell. Point number five. I came to understand that sovereignty is not an eternal attribute of God that would be compromised by the existence of free moral creatures. Some seem to believe that for God to be considered quote-unquote sovereign, then men cannot have a free or autonomous will. But should sovereignty be interpreted and understood as the necessity of God to play both sides of the chessboard, so to speak, in order to ensure his victory? Or should we be able to understand God's infinite and mysterious ways of accomplishing his purposes and ensuring his victory in, through, and despite the free choices of creation? Now, I'm not pretending that we can really understand his infinite ways or the means by which he accomplishes all things in conjunction with man's will. We can't even understand our own ways, much less his. As Deuteronomy 29, 29 says, the revealed things belong to man, but the hidden things still belong to God. 
What I am saying, however, is that the revelation of God's holiness, his unwillingness to even tempt men to sin, as James 1.13 teaches, his, his absolute perfect nature and separateness from sin, as we see in Isaiah 48.17, that certainly appears to suggest that our finite linear logical constructs should not be used to contain him, as Isaiah 55.9 teaches. See, one point that really helped me to understand the apparent contradiction of this debate was realizing the divine attribute of sovereignty is really not an eternal attribute of God. Calvinists always argue that God cannot deny himself or his eternal nature, which I agree is true. God cannot stop being God. But based on this logic and this reasoning, and I think a misdefinition of the word sovereign, Calvinists have concluded that because God is eternally, quote-unquote, sovereign, meaning complete meticulous control over everything, that he cannot deny that sovereignty, an attribute of his very nature, by allowing for others to have any measure of control or authority or autonomy. What the Calvinist, I think, fails to see is that sovereignty, as they have defined it, is not an eternal attribute. Sovereignty means complete rule of dominion over creation, or his ability to rule, his right to rule over creation. For God to be in control over creation, there has to be something uh, to control. Now, some even have rightly defined this as God's providence and his right to providentially control that which he wants to control. But he cannot display his power over creatures unless creatures exist. In other words, he can't display his sovereign control or his providence over that which doesn't exist. Therefore, before creation, the concept of sovereignty and providence was not an attribute that could be used to describe God. An eternal attribute is something God possesses that is not contingent upon something else. The eternal attribute of God is really his omnipotence, which refers to his eternally limitless power. Sovereignty, really, it's a, it's a, temporal, a temporal characteristic. It's not an eternal one. Thus, we can say God is all-powerful, not because he's sovereign, but he's sovereign because he is all-powerful, or at least he's as sovereign as he chooses to be in relation to this temporal world. You see, if our all-powerful, sovereign God chose to refrain from meticulously ruling over every part of that which he creates, that in no way denies his eternal attribute of omnipotence. It indeed affirms it. It's the Calvinist who, I think, though well-intending, He's the one who's denying the eternal attribute of God's omnipotence by presuming that the all-powerful God, the all-creative knowing one, cannot refrain from meticulous deterministic rule over his creation, i.e. his sovereignty as they've wrongly defined it. In short, the Calvinist denies God's eternal attribute of omnipotence, his all-powerfulness, in his effort to protect the temporal attribute of quote-unquote sovereign meticulous control over all things. Additionally, an argument could be made that the eternal attribute of God's love and his holiness are likewise compromised by the otherwise well-meaning efforts of our Calvinistic brethren to protect their theory of deterministic sovereignty over the temporal world. Now, please understand, sovereignty is most certainly an attribute of God over creation. He has the right to rule over his creation however he chooses as a king, as a sovereign. But this is a temporal attribute. The omnipotent God has not yet fully taken sovereign control in the sense of taking dominion over uh, the earth and the heaven. And is that not his prerogative to give to the principalities and the authorities and the rulers um, to this world, as, as the scriptures say in, in Psalm 115, 3, God sits in heavens and does what he pleases. But the equally valid truth in verse 16, that he has given the the earth over to man, that he has given the earth over to principalities and authorities and rulers of this dark world. Isaiah 24, 21 says, A time is coming when the Lord will punish the powers above the rulers of the earth. Ephesians 6, 12 says, We do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Are we to believe that God is meticulously controlling the spiritual forces of darkness in this world? Colossians 2.20 says, You have died with Christ, and he has set you free from the evil powers of this world. He's acknowledging that there is a power outside of his own. It doesn't mean he's not more powerful than it. It doesn't mean that he won't conquer and destroy it completely when that time comes that all things will be put under his rule, that all things will be brought uh, to rights, so to speak. 
But until that happens, there is power outside autonomous, separate from God. That's what we call evil. That's what separates that which is of a godly purpose from that which is of an evil purpose. We separate God's will from the will of Satan, from the will of evil power and forces, from the will of evil men who do evil things. 1 Corinthians 15, 24 says, when the end, then the end will come, Christ will overcome all spiritual rulers, authorities, and powers, and will hand the kingdom to God the Father. See, don't, please don't misunderstand my point. I affirm that God is greater than all these powers and authorities. He created them after all. Colossians 1.16 says, For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things were created by him and ultimately for him. And one day God will strip them of that authority. In some sense, we could say, um, in the eternal sense, God already has through the cross. Colossians 2.15, God stripped the spiritual rulers and powers of their authority. With the cross, he won the victory and showed the world they were powerless. And when judgment day comes, when God finally makes all things right with the new heavens and the new earth, then of course that authority, that power will completely be uh, dissolved, taken away. Much more can be said, obviously, but in short, we must refrain from bringing unbiblical conclusions based upon our finite perceptions of God's nature. We must accept the revelation of Scripture. He is holy, Isaiah 6, 3. He does not take pleasure in sin, Psalm 5, 4. Some moral evil does not even enter in his holy mind, Jeremiah 7, 31. He genuinely desires every individual to come to him and be saved, 2 Peter 3, 9, 1 Timothy 2, 4. No man will stand before the Father and be able to give the excuse, I was born unloved by my Creator. I was born unchosen without hope of salvation. I was born unable to see, hear, or understand God's revelation of himself. No, they will stand without excuse, as Romans 1.20 says. God loves all people, John 3.16. He calls them all to salvation, 2 Corinthians 5.20. He reveals himself to them, Titus 2.11, and provides the means by which their sins would be forgiven, 1 John 2.2. 2. I like what A.W. Tozer concluded when he said, God sovereignly decreed that man should be free to exercise moral choice. And man from the beginning has fulfilled that decree by making his choice between good and evil. When he chooses to do evil, he does not thereby countervail the sovereign will of God, but fulfills it. Inasmuch the eternal decree decided not which choice the man should make, but that he should be free to make it. If in his absolute freedom God has willed to give man limited freedom, who is there to stay his hand or say, Why dost thou? Man's will is free because God is sovereign. A God less than sovereign could not bestow moral freedom upon his creatures. He would be afraid to do so. Here I stand. I can do no other. So help me God. Amen. Thanks for listening.